the church being formed by Scripture. And uh, I'm going to come back to some of the why on this in a moment. But you're going to kind of, as we work our way through the sermon, see how important and crucial the practice of daily formation by the Word of God is to the life of a multiplying disciple, which is what we're all about as a church. And so I want to encourage you, simple church leaders, make sure you're kind of having those conversations around daily devos with your simple churches. I encourage you to hold each other accountable uh, to the process. It can be challenging, especially uh, as you sort of figure out, how do I create space in my life to daily be in Scripture? But I promise you, it's worth it. It's so, so good. And so... Uh, just an encouragement on that. If you don't have your Daily Devos book, you can talk to Annie uh, if you're a Simple Church leader, and you can always catch one online at engage.liftchurch.ca under Discipleship Resources. All right, we're in Mark 4, the parable of the sower today, which is awesome. It's a classic, classic text, and I'm excited to get into it um, this evening. So why don't we just pray, and then we're getting into the Word. Jesus, thank you so much for how much you want to teach us. Thank you so much that you love us, that you gave us your word. Lord, I just pray that as we study it together this afternoon, that we would be changed and molded and shaped by it, that we wouldn't leave the same way we've come in. Father, I pray you keep me humble, gracious and kind as I communicate. Jesus, that your heart of being full of grace and full of truth would come through. Amen. Amen. Mark 4, we're going to, be, we're going to read the first um, probably 12 verses here together. Uh, production team, I, I put the wrong number in, so we're going to go to verse 12, and then we're going to do verse 13 to 20 as we work our way through the sermon. So let's read together. Again, he, Jesus, began to teach by the sea, and a very large crowd gathered around him. So he got into a boat on the sea and sat down. While the whole crowd was by the sea on the shore, he taught them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, listen, consider the sower who went out to sow. That means a sower is like somebody that, uh, that scatters seed. Consider the sower who went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell on the path and some birds came and devoured it. And other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil. And it grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. When the sun came out, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it. And it didn't produce fruit. Still, the other seed fell on good ground, and it grew up producing fruit that increased 30, 60, and 100 times. Then he said, let anyone who has ears to hear listen. When he was alone, Jesus, those around him, those around him with the twelve, asked him about the parables. He answered them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those outside, everything comes in parables, so that they may indeed look and yet not perceive. They may indeed listen and yet not understand. Otherwise, they might turn back and be forgiven. This is one of Jesus' uh, kind of first parables that we're really going to be getting into in the Gospel of Mark. We're going to be spending a number of weeks actually on the parables. Now, Jesus is doing something very interesting here in the parable. We tend to, especially those of us that have grown up in the church, we tend to think of parables like they are illustrations designed to help the listeners understand a point. But that is, in fact, the opposite of what a parable is. Jesus is quite clear, and the text is quite clear, that Jesus spoke in parables so that people wouldn't understand him. Like, what? I'll say it again. Jesus spoke in parables so that people wouldn't necessarily understand him. Mark sets up a really interesting scene in the first verse. He establishes that there is a large crowd that is gathering around Jesus. Jesus is in the phase of his ministry where the crowds are coming to him. They're hearing about the miracles. They're hearing about this really interesting teaching. They're wondering, maybe this Jesus is going to launch the revolution that we've been waiting for for so long. And so the crowds come, and they're hoping that Jesus is who they want him to be. And Jesus responds to the crowds in the most bizarre way. 
by teaching them with a tool that intentionally confuses them. Sometimes I feel like that's what you guys think I try to do. Listen to what he says in verse 11. He says, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but those outside... So the disciples, they, they come to Jesus in, in verse 11, and, and they're like, Jesus, hold on a sec. Like, we're confused. We don't understand what you're teaching. Can you help us understand? And in the inner circle of a small group of Jesus followers, no longer with a large crowd, Jesus explains to them that to them he's willing to give the answers, but to others on the outside he's not willing to give them the whole story. He's intentionally going to limit access. You see, Jesus understood something about being a disciple. I talk a lot about discipleship at Live Church. In fact, we pretty much talk about it every week. And he understood that when he was going to call people to be disciples, it was an incredibly dangerous, sacrificial journey that they were going to go on. Being a disciple of Jesus was incredibly countercultural. In at least two ways. First of all, Jesus was a threat to, and his followers were perceived as a threat to, the ruling Roman Empire. At this time in first century kind of area around Jerusalem or Israel, the Romans were ruling. And if you know anything about Roman rule, it was incredibly authoritative. They ruled with an iron fist. And over the centuries leading up to Jesus, there had been a number of specific revolutionaries that sought to uh, establish a free state for the people of Israel. And Jesus knew that if he attracted a ton of followers, the Romans would look at him as a threat to their rule. Because the people expected Jesus to overthrow them. Now on the flip side, so Jesus was a threat to the Romans. He was also a threat to the ruling Jewish elite because Jesus didn't come to do what they expected him to do. And so if you threw your lot in with Jesus, you were both going to offend the Jewish culture of the day as well as the Roman culture of the day. And Jesus knew this. Jesus is looking down the line and he anticipates that there are people who are eager to listen to him. They're happy to sit on the shore and listen to his teaching so long as he's healing people and inviting them to a new way of living that's whole and good. But he also knows that this new way, this new kingdom that he is initiating is going to cost them their lives. And so he intentionally begins to limit the message to only those that will really truly be willing to lay hold of the cost of discipleship. Jesus makes it very clear later in his teaching that the cost of following Jesus is the cost of dying to ourselves. All of our self-interest, all of our motivations, all of our hopes, all of our dreams, we lay them down at Jesus' feet and we say, Jesus, you are now the king of my life. I think sometimes in the church we have made an idol out of building crowds more than we have made our ambition building disciples. Jesus' goal was always to raise disciples that would be willing to follow him wherever he would go. go. Not just attract a crowd that would happily listen to his nice ideas. This leads me to one of my first points I really want to drive home today is that when we talk about disciple-making, and the rest of my message is going to be about how do we make disciples the way Jesus made disciples, and it's not just a process of confusing them, although sometimes it feels like it. One of the hardest parts of disciple-making, point number one, is that not everyone is going to go the journey. When we invite people to follow Jesus, not everybody is going to respond and say, you know what, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. I'm totally 100% in. I'm going to give my life to the kingdom of Jesus. You know what? Where's the hardest place I can move to? I'm going to move there, and I'm going to evangelize people, raise the dead. It's going to be amazing. I'm going to intentionally adopt a, a celibate life like I talked about last week, or maybe intentionally see how much I can maximize my generosity. Like, the call to the Christian life is incredibly countercultural. 
And we need to understand that in the process of dis making disciples, not everyone is going to go the journey. In fact, some disciples may openly reject us in the process. Why do I share this? You're like, man, that's really, really encouraging. Thank you, Pastor. You keep telling us to make disciples, and now you're telling us that we're going to fail when we make disciples. One of the things that I've learned over the last 15 years of disciple making here, 14 years of making disciples here at McMaster, is that one of the most painful parts of disciple making is when disciples reject us. One of the most painful parts of making disciples is when we invest, we pour energy into, we, we sacrifice our time, our money, our resources, our hearts, our emotions. We open our lives up to people. I preached about this um, on the webcast two weeks ago that we have an obligation as disciple makers, a responsibility to open our lives up, to live transparent and vulnerable. But there's a price that we pay when we live vulnerable is that sometimes the people we're vulnerable with hurt us. And the temptation in the process of disciple making is that when we run into that hurt, when we run into the rejection, when we run into the pain, when we run into the, the, the sort of the, the confusion that comes from, I thought I did everything right and they've still rejected me. The temptation is to say, therefore, I have failed as a disciple maker. I'm going to pack my bags and I'm going to go home. Church, if only you knew how many times those thoughts had crossed my mind. At one point, I remember I was so grieved from a particular uh, situation that Laura and I had worked through that I just sat on my couch and banged my head against the wall. Not out of anger, just out of a sheer total confusion. Lord, I thought I did everything right. But sometimes when we make disciples doesn't work, the way, work out the way we hope it will. Why do I share this? Because our responsibility as disciple makers is not to be people pleasers, but to be people who glorify Jesus. The objective of making disciples is not to see ourselves be successful disciple makers, it's not to say, hey, look at my fruit, look how great I am, look at, the, look at the disciple that I raised up, look at the simple church that I led and sent. As we celebrate the simple churches that have successfully uh, sent uh, apprentices, I also know that there's equally as many simple church apprentices over the years that have not been successful, that have stumbled on the journey or... But we, so what do we do? We proceed to make disciples to glorify Jesus. He is our goal. He is our ambition. He is our hope. He is our dream. He is our desire. And as we make disciples, we glorify him. We don't please people. The primary goal of discipleship is about Jesus, seeing him glorified, seeing him worshiped. The primary goal is not to gather large crowds. You know, over the years, I, as Lyft blew up, I've been tempted to, to be like, oh, man, we, I wonder if we could build an even bigger crowd. And the Lord has been teaching me to just change the metric. How many disciples are we sending to new places? Not how many people do we gather on Sundays? How many simple church families have told people about Jesus for the first time this week? How many people got to see Jesus sacrificially through Serve Our City this week? How many campuses were we able to see Jesus glorified in for the very first time? Metrics that have nothing to do with what happens here as we gather, but have everything to do with Jesus being glorified in a world that desperately needs to know him. I want to encourage you as you're making disciples. Jesus has some people that are very confused around him. But then he brings his disciples close. He opens his life up. And he's vulnerable with him. And he says to them, to you guys, I'm going to start to, to give you some secrets because you're starting to understand. You're starting to grow. 
and he starts to invest in a few people. He starts to intentionally pour his life into just a few people. Who are the few people that you are intentionally discipling in the way of Jesus? Opening your life up, just as the way Jesus does here. Don't worry about building a crowd. Don't worry about standing on a platform. Don't worry about your success. Don't worry about having a celebration video about you. We'll get there. Just worry about seeing a few people in your life come to encounter Jesus. And there's a really beautiful gift that Jesus gives us in this text. He says, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Notice that the secret of the kingdom was given. That they didn't earn it. They weren't like, Jesus isn't like, you guys are like the super smart disciples. You're the ones that really like, you get it, so I'm going to pull you close. No, you see, this is the paradox of the Christian life, which is that as we make disciples, the process of actually knowing and responding to Jesus is a gift of the Holy Spirit. We don't force people to know Jesus. We don't yell at them. We don't scream at them. We don't bang our fists and say, you need to follow Jesus. I don't think anybody's doing that. If you are, please stop. <laughs> it is a gift that the Holy Spirit gives to someone. We don't need to force it. We don't need to bang on it. In fact, apart from a move of God in someone's heart, the gospel, our message about the death and resurrection of Jesus is actually foolishness. It doesn't even make sense. And so we need to pray that the Holy Spirit would begin to soften the people we're telling about Jesus, soften their hearts so that they would respond to the gospel. So that rather than hearing something confusing, they would hear something clear. Our job isn't to convince people of the gospel. Our job is to faithfully sow seed and pray that the Holy Spirit will cultivate it. That isn't to diminish in any way the responsibility that each of us, including you, have to make disciples and tell people about Jesus. All of us, if we're Jesus followers, have a responsibility to tell people about Jesus. We do not have a responsibility to save people. That is a gift of the Holy Spirit. We need to be faithful to sow and faithful to pray. What do we sow with is the question. When we're making disciples, what do we make disciples with? Like, what's the substance of disciple making? I have a lot of people that are asking me, Robin, how do we make disciples? Like, I, you keep talking about disciple making. How do I actually do that? The webcast that we do on Thursday nights all about making disciples. Really, we try to get a lot more practical, equipping, tools, th things like that. We wrote a book on it. It's coming out in a few weeks to help you guys make disciples. But really, what is the substance of discipleship? Jesus gives us a clue here. In verse 13, he says, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand all of the parables? I love it. Jesus is like, if you don't understand this one, you might as well quit and go home. And then he gives them a clue. He says, if you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand any of the parables. But then he begins to explain the parable. And he opens with this. He says, the sower sows the what? Come on, somebody. Well, we got a discrepancy here. The sower sows, I don't know, is it on the screen? It's not on the screen. The word. The sower sows the word. I know, the sower sows seeds, I get it. <laughs> but he sows seeds of the word. The sower sows the word. The word of what? The word of God. The sower sows the word. What is the substance of discipleship? What do we disciple people with? Do we disciple people with the seeds of our ideas? No. Do we disciple people by bringing them to church and hoping they really, really like the worship? No. I mean, you guys are awesome. I love the worship team. I'm just picking on you. Do we disciple people by hoping that they really like the book on discipleship that we give them? No. Do we disciple people by by uh, having increasing numbers of coffees about increasingly esoteric subjects? No. We, we disciple people 
with the word. The sower sows the word. The foundation of all discipleship is scripture. The word of God. Our primary job as disciple makers is to invite people to know and be formed by what Jesus teaches through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. The sower sows the word. This is why we're putting such an emphasis on daily devotions. We cannot disciple people in our ideas. We must disciple people in the word. And that means daily coming before Scripture and saying, Jesus, show me who you are. If you look at uh, movements throughout history, the movements that have a, the greatest impact for the kingdom of God have all been movements that have been based on a simple obedience to the word of God. Coming before the word and saying, Jesus, who are you? I want to be like you. Make me like you and help me, help me make other people like you you. Discipleship is about teaching people to be entirely holistically formed by the word of God so that they understand it in their mind, they're transformed by it in their hearts, and then it's lived in their day-to-day, moment-by-moment lives. I want to encourage you, if you've been like, I don't know how to disciple, I don't know how to teach people about Jesus, to begin the process of Daily, simply with somebody that you're trying to lead closer to Jesus, sitting down and saying, what does the word teach us about God? What does it teach us about us? And what are we going to do about it? Now, there's three examples, well, really four, but three negative and then one positive example that Jesus gives of what happens when we try to sow the word into people. So you're like really practically like, cool, I'm going to do that, and then they're going to ignore me anyway. Probably, but that's okay. I want to show us how Jesus is going to give us three examples of how the word is actually something of a process that people learn to digest. It's not automatic. In fact, a lot of the times we kind of fail forward through the process. So verse 15, some are like the word sown on the path. When they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word sown in them. Some are like the word sown on the path. When they hear immediately, Satan comes and takes away the word sown in them. Church, we are ultimately, when we are making disciples, we are fighting a spiritual battle. The process of disciple making is not an intellectual battle primarily. It is primarily and essentially a spiritual battle. We have a spiritual enemy who desires to disrupt, distort, and derail all discipleship efforts, especially anything that will see the word formed in people. Now, there's this really beautiful metaphor, both uh, by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians and uh, by the author of Hebrews, where it talks about the word of God being like a sword. The word of God is like a sword. We don't wage war as Christians. We don't fight enemies. We don't engage with the world around us on the terms and with the, the tools of the world around us. We don't use things like gossip and violence and anger and deceit and, and, and lies and pettiness and insecurity. We don't need those tools because we've been given a better tool to fight. We don't need to respond to to a discipleship issue of violence with violence. We don't need to respond to a discipleship issue uh, with anger. We need to respond with the word. We fight spiritual battles with spiritual tools, and the tool we have been given is the word of God. What does that mean? It means that we need to teach, as we are sowing the word into people, we need to also teach our disciples to begin to pray that word over themselves. So as you teach someone, hey, let me introduce you to a piece of scripture that is life-giving, you want to also teach them, hey, remember to pray this, remember to, to lay hold of this truth and use it so that when the enemy comes to derail you, you can say, actually, no, the word of God says this.
where we feel like we're distant from God, where we're far from God, and we're trying to disciple someone to say, hey, actually, no, you're, you're close to God. You've been redeemed by Jesus. Instead of just telling them the idea, we tell them to stand on the word. And the word says that nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God. That's the word. Teach them to use it, to pray it, to lay hold of it, to memorize it. That's why memorizing is a whole day of the week in daily devotions. We practice internalizing and memorizing the word so that we can use it as a tool for battle. So the first thing we need to do is we need to lay hold of the word and use it as a tool. And as we do that, it puts deeper roots in us. Number two, Jesus talks about the challenges of distress and persecution. So the first battle people face is a spiritual battle. The second people face is a circumstantial battle. And others are like seeds sown on rocky ground. When they hear the word, immediately they receive it with joy. But they have no root. They are short-lived. When distress or persecution comes because of the word, they immediately fall away. Hashtag flaky. Never have I dealt with this issue. Mm -mm, no experience. In my own life or others. I mean, let's be real. This is like, man, this is like, this is like Jesus was just reading the mail from the 21st century and being like, you guys. I call, them, I, I call it roller coaster Christianity. It's like, I'm so on fire. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'll do whatever it takes. I'm going to tithe like 3,000%. It doesn't even mathematically make sense, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to serve like nine days a week. Also doesn't make sense, but I'm going to do it. And then 10 minutes later, we're like, I don't, I don't even know if I believe in Jesus. I'm being a little bit extreme, but this is like, come on, this has been so many of our experiences. We, we commit, and then instead of our yes being a yes, our yes is kind of like a, well, maybe. Well, I didn't really mean it. We receive the word. We receive the call to be, for example, servants of the lost. We receive the call to be disciple-making disciples, and we say yes and amen. That's amazing. I'm going to believe it. But then we walk out the door, and the seed doesn't put down any roots. Now, rather than just yelling at you guys and being like, ah, don't be flaky, crotchety old man. I think there's actually an indication of what we can do about that in this text. What's the issue here? It says, when distress or persecution comes because of the word, they immediately fall away. It doesn't say if distress or persecution comes because of the word. It says when. If you are a follower of Jesus, I want to remind you to again go back to the word and repeatedly Jesus especially but throughout the New Testament we are taught and told that the process of following Jesus is going to result in stress anxiety and persecution in our life they're not my words those are Jesus words the Apostle Paul's words and I think sometimes what we do is we assume that that the process of following Jesus is this beautiful linear process of upward towards glory. When in fact, in many cases, it is painful, difficult, slogging through the mud, the mire, it's often confusing. Church, we mustn't be surprised when things get difficult. Instead, we need to say thank you Jesus, that you have sawn fit, that you see it fit, to use this to refine me and teach me to trust you. Instead of looking at the moments of pain and confusion and hurt angrily and with resentment towards the Lord and we abandon things, instead of looking at the moment where our simple church is, is maybe not working out and we want to quit, we instead say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you have given me the blessing of being refined by a challenge. There was an author, his name's Nabil Qureshi. He famously was, he was a Muslim guy that became a, a Christian and wrote a number of books about it. 
pretty interesting, but he was 34, and, and when he was 34, he was diagnosed with a very aggressive late-stage stomach cancer. Tragically, he, he ended up dying. I, I was really blessed. Laura was doing some work with him through her, um, her public uh, relations work, and I got to meet him, and he was an incredible follower of Jesus. I don't think I've ever met anybody quite as articulate and passionate about following Jesus as he was. But when he, was, when he announced that he had stomach cancer, and he basically was like, this is, this is not a good situation. Listen to how he responds. This is an announcement, this is what he wrote, that I never expected to make. But God in his infinite wisdom, sorry, his infinite and sovereign wisdom, has chosen me for this refining. And I pray he will be glorified through my body and my spirit. But God in his infinite and sovereign wisdom has chosen me for this refining. And I pray he will be glorified through my body and my spirit. The writers of the New Testament implore us to respond to trial, challenge, adversity, and persecution with praise. Church, what if that was the heartbeat of our church? Rather than despairing or quitting when things get hard, and I don't think that this is the character of our church. Our our church has a character of perseverance and grit. But I want to encourage you to, when things get hard, to be a people that praise Jesus, that he is choosing to refine us. That's not to say that we can't take breaks and that we have to drive ourselves into the dust until we're miserable. I actually did a whole episode, and the book that I mentioned is a whole chapter dedicated to, to being healthy and discerning when we need to step back and when we need to keep going. But those aren't things that we do in isolation. Those are always things that we do in community and discern in community. But our default should always be to respond to a challenge, our immediate reaction. We need to train our spirits to respond to persecution, to respond to adversity by saying, thank you, Jesus, for refining me this way. One of the great evangelists, David Livingston, uh, was journeying through Africa, uh, through I think it was the Congo. He was deep, deep into the bush somewhere. He was telling people about Jesus and he It says this of him. It says, his hand was bitten and and he was maimed by a lion, which is awesome. What have you done for Jesus? I got my arm bit off. I know someone who's a crocodile bit his arm off. And anyway, it's a crazy story. I'll tell it another time. His wife died on the field. Uh, He was uh, often alone in his travels. Um, He built a house and it burned to the ground. Um, Often he was sick. He had dysentery and he was constantly battling disease. Someone once told him that he had sacrificed a lot for the gospel, and his response was this. Sacrifice? Cliffhanger. Sacrifice, the only sacrifice is to live outside the will of God. He was asked what helped him to go on despite so much hardship. He said that always ringing in his ears, even when he was terribly sick with the words of Jesus. Notice, what does he anchor on? What does he anchor on? He anchors on the word. He sits on the word. He depends on the word. He goes back to the word. And he says, Jesus says this in Matthew, I am with you always, even until the very end of the world. Seeds that go on rocky soil, they have no roots. That was their issue. And so when things get hard, when the temperature changes, when the environment isn't as conducive to growth, they cease to grow. But having roots means that you are anchored in something other than yourself. To have deep roots is to be rooted into something other than yourself. And so the call of the disciples is a reminder to trust and lean on the work of Jesus daily in our lives. The third thing that Jesus implores in us, first, is to remember that we are fighting a spiritual battle. Secondly, to remind us to anchor into the word and to respond to adversity with praise. And thirdly, he says this in verse 18, others are like seeds sown among thorns. There are ones who hear the word, but the worries of the age, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it 
becomes unfruitful. Jesus gives us three things that will derail effective multiplying discipleship. He says, firstly, worries of the age. Our world is pretty chaotic. Apparently, we had a nuclear waste accident this morning. I studied nuclear engineering, and this was me this morning. Because I was like, if there's no issue, why are you telling us there's an issue? And if there is an issue, why are we not all completely freaking out? And then an hour later, hey, guys, there's no issue. I was like, oh, gracious. How not to do PR. Our world is chaotic, right? It's been a tumultuous couple weeks, especially in global politics. And the temptation is to look at what's going on in our world and conclude that our world is out of control. To allow the worries of our age, the things that are happening in our world, the things that are happening in our city, and the things that are happening on our campus to dictate our response. Church, we don't respond to what's happening in our world with fear. We choose to be people that proclaim hope. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. Not because it doesn't matter, it's a profound consequence, but our job is to faithfully stand on the word of God that there is a God that is sovereign and in control, and we as a people will be sent into the world to be a people of hope, joy, and life into the midst of that fear and brokenness. That's why I love Serve Our City so much. Our church every week across the network is feeding hundreds and hundreds of people. It's amazing and it's beautiful. And as we do that, into the worries of our age, people that are racked with anxiety and depression and loneliness, we speak hope and life and joy. So to every person that is living into the idea that we're all servants to the lost, we, this church, when we engage in things like Serve Our City and Strategic Missional Engagement and Simple Church and all the other things that are going on, we are people that instead of looking at the worries of this age and despairing, we look at the worries of the age and say, I can't wait for what Jesus is going to do. The second derailment is the deceitfulness of wealth. Wealth is deceitful. How is wealth deceitful? Because wealth teaches us that we can be self-sufficient. And many of us have a poverty mindset where we think that if we had more, then we could. If we had more money, then we could be more generous. That's not the way generosity works. If we had more time, then I could be more giving with my time. If I had more talent, then I would be more successful. If I had more relationships, then I would be more secure. It's not just referring to wealth financially. I think it's referring to wealth in the many areas of our lives where we think because we have not enough, what we need is more. But what Scripture teaches in 2 Peter, that is in Christ we have everything that we need for godliness. Again, anchoring on the word, in Christ we have everything we need. We are wealthy in Christ. We have the relationships we need in Christ. We are not a people of poverty. We are a people of great and glorious abundance. And we can give, we can send, and we can sow. Why? Not because we have enough, but because the Lord is our provider. This is why as a church we never limit our vision to our resources. We haven't said, well, check it out. We've got enough people to plant churches on every campus in the country. So cool, we're going to set a vision for planting every church. Guys, we don't have enough people to plant churches on campuses. Unless all of you are planning to be church planners, which I think you should be. But <laughs> Is it going to come on? <laughs> No, we've stepped out in faith, standing in God's word that he's building his church. Trusting that as we disciple people, some of you will step up to the plate and say, I will go, I will be sent. We don't form our vision based on what we have. We form our vision based on the promises of our God. And it is fun to be a church of faith. The lastly, lastly, Jesus highlights desire for other things. I love this. And all the other things that you want, all the other temptations you have, those are a problem too. Those will also derail discipleship. You know, the truth is sometimes we just want stuff. We look at the world around us and we say, that looks good. It looks nice. Yeah, yeah, I should make disciples, but I'm going to go and 
get really rich instead. Yeah, yeah, I should serve people, but I don't, I don't really need to. But my question to you just as we close is what's your other thing? He says, and the desires of other things enter in and choke the word. What is the desire of your heart right now that is choking the word, choking God's ability to speak to you, call you to wholeness? Take a minute. I just want to take 30 seconds to think about that. I'm going to invite the worship team up. You guys can come on up. I'm going to close with this, so in case you're confused. I ask that question again. What is the one thing that is choking the word, the desire, the longing of your heart that is derailing your ability to be formed by the word? Secondly, I want you to think through the people in your world, your, particularly your simple church. What is the one thing in some of your disciples' lives that is choking their ability to be formed by the word? I want to invite you to have a conversation with them about it. But not a conversation on your ideas. I want you to go and study scripture. And then bring scripture to the person that you're thinking of and say, hey, I've been studying scripture. What do you think of this? You don't need to beat them over the head with it. Remember I said we don't use the tools of our world. We don't yell at people. We just say, hey, I think God has a better way. What do you think? And finally, Jesus promises this. And those who are like seed sown on good ground, hear the word, welcome it, and produce fruit. Six, 30, 60, and 100 times what is sown. Church, I pray that we would be a people, that as we receive the word, we would multiply it into others. How do you know? Like, What's a guaranteed marker that you are being formed by the word? that you're bearing fruit and disciple-making in the world around you. As you are molded by the word, it's not for you. It's so that you can ultimately see other people led closer to Jesus, be molded by him. So on that kind of exhortation, I'm just gonna invite us to bow our heads.